Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And, uh, my name is Naveen Kumar, and I'm an assistant professor of horticulture and extension specialist. I work for both universities, UMES and UME. And uh, I joined the university in 2016. And uh, I came from Florida. I worked for the University of Florida for almost eight years. I worked on citrus canker, citrus greening, global climate change, nutrition. And when I came here, I realized, okay, I cannot grow citrus here, so what to do? Then I started studying USDA data, what we used to grow in lower three counties. And then I came to know, oh, we were the fruit hub and we used to produce so many different kinds of fruits. And uh, if you look at this picture, almost 6 million pounds of apple each year, almost some 100 years ago in lower shore. But the current production is zero. Not only in lower counties, if you will look at the data, in, throughout the Maryland, there is a 53% decline in apple production over a period of almost 100 years. So it's not only in apples, if you will look at peaches, same thing. At lower shore, almost 6.4 million pounds of peaches every year. And then nothing, there is no commercial production in our area. And throughout Maryland, this is more severe, 84% decline over a century. So we are highly advanced, improved root stocks, improved scions, but we didn't gain much. We actually lose over the years. Look at this picture, not only strawberries. We were the world leader in strawberry production, Marion Station, strawberry capital of the world. And this is a news from 1920 newspaper, the Chicago Packer, and it shows and it's, it's almost, we produce the enormous amount of strawberries that is just one day production is total Maryland. We also celebrate a strawberry festival and our advancement is just, we have human strawberries nowadays in Maryland. So this is our advancement. And we have a place called Fruitland. And uh, that is without fruits. So this is what I studied, okay, we lost everything. So can we restart, can we reinitiate? And look here, I teach two courses and my students, they become bored. Hey Kumar, it's enough. No more books, we want to do something outside. So it's enough of horticultural books. So, so these are our vision. I don't have much data to show what we started last year. And I hope this will be promising in coming year. So our target is okay. This will increase farm income. If we have one acre of a land, two acre of a land, we can start, we can grow some fruit trees to attract consumers. We can promote crop diversification other than row crops. Not only this, we will decrease carbon footprint because we import most of the fruits from the other states. So why not to grow our own? And enrich human nutrition. Another important thing is agrotourism. Look at this, my orchard. We have our babies and we have geese babies. So this is ecotourism. <laughs> and it's a pretty simple question. For example, a high school student came to our orchard and by mistake he asked, okay, do you know the scientific name of apple? How many of us know the scientific name of apple? So this is agroecotourism. If students are coming to our orchard, at least we must know something. They may ask anything. So, malus domestica, right? Okay. So what we did? We planted last year, March 7th. Our major rootstocks are EMLA 111 and EMLA 7. I also have some trees on these dwarf one. But let me tell you, my dwarfs, they are no more. They all are dead. So I planted some 30 different kinds of scions so that we can expand production from early July to early November. <coughs> and another thing is when students and their parents will come after two or three years, they can see different, different types of apples. So that will actually inculcate, okay, Look here, there is a diversity of apples and 
there is a possibility someone will like okay let's grow some apple trees in backyards just like in Florida each and everyone most of the time they have a citrus tree in their backyard so this is our vision why not to grow apple tree in each and every backyard in Maryland so this is our crop geometry in addition to science we also plant some pollinizers of course for the teaching purposes because we have so many varieties we don't actually need this but just to show to the students yes we have pollinizers if you are selecting only a few varieties you need them so this is our row geometry because we have semi dwarf type of things so row to row distance we maintain 20 feet tree to tree 10 and we are expecting to maintain the height up to 15 feet we are expecting four three to four walls of scaffolds and training will be central leader and uh, in the floor management we planted tall fescue a very high rate 200 pounds per acre to remove or suppress any kind of weeds in future we also maintain weed free three feet zone around our trees so after planting we install our irrigation lines we just use one inch main line three quarter of an inch row lines and just a single emitter it works very well during the last year we just provides nine grams of nitrogen to each and every plant we have optimum amount of potassium and phosphorus in our soil so we didn't apply anything but just after planting bad dreams starts and in April we have an attack of cedar apple rust and this is so so dangerous it slowed the growth of almost each and every tree I didn't find anything resistance tolerant whatever it is in all the 30 different kinds of scions each and everything is severely affected but however something interesting I observed the scions on EMLA 111 they somehow overcome this disease they look better after three or four months in comparison to EMLA 7 or whatever other dwarf one so this is the interesting observation I observed. Similarly, one after another, June to August, attack of Japanese beetle. And look here, they are not only eating, they are making babies in my orchard. <laughs> so it was very scary. And they attack on each and every plant. Trees were almost naked. Then I sprayed 7XLR just twice. And not only this, then September, October, look at this. Sometimes we forgot after, after putting this stem guard and I got an attack from mealybugs in most of the trees. And they just almost girded the phloem or the bark of the trees. I simply washed them with very dilute soap and everything was okay. Nothing happened after that. I left some of the varieties intentionally to fruit and this is yellow transparent and look so not only mealybug then these crows they started so all these little little observations are providing me how I will protect my plants in future actually we purchased a new land at UMES almost 21 acres of land so our future plan is once we will screen our all the basic problems using this small orchard we are going for a big commercial orchard so this is actually helping us what are our major so growth over a period of one year I classified into 0 to 10 11 to 20 and 21 to 30 inches in some there is a pretty good growth like this lower threes they are on EMLA 111 and those top one they are on EMLA 7 so I saw growth but these guys very poor growth so these are some of my interesting observation we all know that yellow transparent is a very early maturing varieties so I purchased only 10 trees because this is a very small orchard so I don't know you can tell me because you are more experienced in case of apple so out of seven I got fruit but in three they produce fruit in October first <coughs> week so this is I'm not able to understand why is it so you can suggest me later on if you know why this happened Similarly, in freezing tolerance, in EMLA 111, we got very freezing temperature on November 3rd. Almost all the trees, they are naked, burning down. But in these scions with EMLA 11, very little effect of such a low temperature. I have no idea this contribution is through rootstock or it's the role of scion, but I observed this thing and we will work later on. 
what are the actual mechanisms what is next this is interesting so last year I got a grant from Maryland soybean board to introduce nanotechnology in soybean and we got some very wonderful results and this year we are going to apply nanotechnology in apples so nano means one billionth of a meter that means if you will divide one meter into one billion equal part each one is a one nanometer under natural conditions most of the particles they are in micro dimensions micro means one millionth of a meter so what we did we used nano zinc oxide nano clay and nano sulfur an interesting thing is all are natural they are present on the earth crust we are not using any dangerous toxic things what we did we convert their micro dimensions into nano dimensions so what is the advantage of these nano dimensions once these molecules they have very after conversion they have very sharp edges so what does that mean that means when insects crawl over these nanoparticles these sharp edges will cleave their cuticle once cuticle is gone their water barrier will go and these insects will die due to desiccation so what is the most significant thing here we are killing the insects by a physical method we are not attacking on DNA, on biochemistry, on enzymes. It's purely a physical method. That means these insects will never develop resistance against these nanoparticles. You are using pesticides, insecticides. Insects can develop resistance because those all chemicals, they attack on biochemistry and on genes of these insects and pests. But in our case, purely physical method. So what we did? So this is the experiment. So we took two petri dishes. This is three star stages of soybean looper. And we spread on another one uniform spray of just nano zinc oxide. And look here, within five hours, look at the size, 80% mortality. And not only this, we use nano sulfur. Look, look at the size. Within five to 24 hours, 100% mortality purely physical organic thing no toxicity look here nano clay what is clay clay is just soil right what we did we just changed the nano dimensions again within 24 hour everything is gone so one can ask oh it's on battery plate and yes of course most of the times these nanotechnologists they performed experiment in petri plate, published a paper and then disappeared, like they never exist. We didn't do that. We five times spray in under field condition and look here. This is a control tree and this tree was sprayed five times and look at, there is no blemishes. Leaf is intact. So this is in vivo, real plants. That means these nanoparticles are really working. So not only on insects, we applied the same nanoparticles on very pathogenic fungus, fusarium head blight, it attacks on wheat. And look here, these are the controls and we place a small amount of fungus in the center of these petri plates and look here, it occupied everything. But once we started nanoparticles and we simply use nano zinc oxide and look here, empty space, empty space. That means these nanoparticles, they are adversely affecting the growth of such a pathogenic fungi. These results may be much better. We don't have highly sophisticated equipment to actually suspend these nanoparticles in the media. Otherwise, these results will be very, very wonderful. There is a possibility that there will be no more growth. So the thing is, we talk so much about fire blight, that is our next attack. So we are going to use these nanoparticles on the growth of Arvinia mylovera. And we are hopeful, yes, these nanoparticles will against against cedar apple rust, Japanese beetle, cucumber beetle, and fire blight bacteria. So we will conduct these experiments this year. And not only this, this is very interesting. We conducted some behavioral studies. And look here, this is a cage. In this cage, we place two plants. One is control, and another plant is treated with nanoparticles. And then we release some cucumber beetle. And after three days, what we observed, these cucumber be beetle, they never attacked on treated leaves. They preferentially ate only the control leaves. 
So that means there is something is going on. They avoid eating the treated leaves. So here is a problem. If you are spraying nanoparticles in your field and your neighbor is not spraying, so they may attack on your neighbor's field. So neighbor may be unhappy and angry. So not only on cucumber beetle, look here. We worked on Japanese beetles, such a dangerous guy. And look here, again, they concentrated on control leaves, water treated leaves. And look here, this is our nano zinc oxide. Clean, they never come nearby it. But again, the problem is when there is nothing, there is no control leaf, they also attacked on NGO leaf. So, in this experiment, so far, we used only one size of the particles, that is 30 nanometer. Our next target is, can we manipulate the size. So there is a possibility instead of using 30, if we can use 60 nanometer, 100 nanometer. So these particles may be more effective. So that is for this year I request many for Maryland so I've been bored. If they are happy they can give, we can go further. So not only this, I got a grant last year, this is called SARE grant and they gave me money to conduct four small workshop in my newly established orchard. So when I started this program, people told me, oh, Naveen Kumar, forget it. No one will come, forget about it. You go teach and enjoy. But this thing become promising. 15 people are now with me from our lower three counties and they will work with me for next three years <coughs> on this orchard and we will learn together. So last Saturday, we organized a pruning workshop. We learned how to prune a central leader. 11 people came. Of course, small number, but it's promising. Zero, 11 is more than zero. <laughs> so, and what is next? This year we are going to plant 16 varieties of pear, both European and Asian. We also ordered some 11 apple varieties on dwarf root stocks. We will also plant day neutral strawberries under low tunnel conditions. And we will also plant primocane raspberries under high tunnels. And we will start our nanotechnology trials. This is our team, Mr. Earl, Emmanuel, Kathy, Sharon, and Luan. We work together. And look here, after work, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work in the field. You know, in Florida, almost eight years, I was a lab animal. I work in lab. I only talk to the bacteria. I never even talk to the plants. <laughs> but once I came to Maryland, I never see my lab, because there is nothing in my lab. So I started, OK, let's start, let's start doing work together. And communicate with local people. So now I started talking with peoples. So this is my advancement from bacteria to humans, plants, <laughs> kids. So I am happy and it's wonderful. Oops. So any questions, suggestions? And maybe next year I will come with more data on nanotechnology if it works on fire blight. That's my main aim. Is, is the nanotechnology being tested in other university situations or are you unique? Let me tell you one thing, yes, I told you, peoples, they just restrict it to petri plate and then they disappear. So we, I think, at UMES and UME, we are the number one. We actually reach to the field conditions. I never find a single paper with they, where they go to actual plant. On petri plate, oh, wonderful result. Very good publication, okay, bye bye. But this time, yes, we observed it. Uh, have you looked at how the nanoparticles can affect the plant and how they can affect predatory insects in the orchard? You know, like beneficial insects? I didn't spray anything in the orchard so far. Oh, okay. I will start especially under greenhouse conditions first. Because these nano, actually, we are using cosmetic creams. All of these things, they already have a nanoparticles. Lipsticks, there is a nanoparticles from almost 20 years ago. So we have in most of our stuff. But the organic guys, they don't like, they don't want to incorporate nanotechnology under organic agriculture because they don't want any type of manipulation even with the size. So I don't know. They will consider it organic or not. But I think it's better than toxic pesticides or insecticides. We are simply using sulfur, zinc, even just clay particles. Anything? Yes, sir. Um, at an orchard right up the road, I've used sulfur for 27 years on my 
and it's it's amazing what it, it, it does. And I've had some you know great years through the 27 years, and um, some other you know mixes of uh, uh, cocktails that you put together, you know, like with uh, garlic and tea extractions, mm -hmm. and, it, and it works. I just I'm having problems with uh, wars. I just can't get. I've got an infestation of wars that I can't get rid of. Yes, just one, once you get an infestation, call me. I will come and collect and we'll apply nano thing. <laughs> just give me a call. If you find any insect, just give me a call. I will come collect. That's the major problem. I, otherwise, I have to purchase these insects from commercial market. Just give me a call. Hey, Kumar, we have bugs come. I will be there. Thank you. I, I want to tell you, I think this is just, this nanoparticle is going to work because, if, you know, in the physiology of our bodies or animal bodies, sulfur in, in the methylation system in cells to get out toxins out of the cell, and I think it's really going to be effective on all, a lot of different diseases uh, because zinc is, you know, we need zinc to get rid of the cold, we need zinc to get rid of disease and to help digest food and that was like you know man a long time ago those systems they ate, they ate from the earth so that was their detoxification system but i think it's really going to work I'm, I'm excited about it actually in nanoparticles it's not only the size these nanoparticles they have charges so again when these particles they are inside the cell they interact with the metabolism of mitochondria, their energy producing system, so they can block that. Not only this, they interfere with the plasma membrane, that is the outermost covering of a cell. So just imagine if this plasma membrane become non-functional, how these insects will survive? Because there is a balance of charges across this membrane, positive, negative, and you have this nanoparticles. It can alter the separation of these charges. Once this separation goes, this membrane become non-functional. In fact, this cell become non-functional. So again, and not only, look, zinc, zinc is a part of our metabolism. Zinc is the part of plant hormone auxin synthesis. So there is a possibility we are not only killing the insect, we can also promote the growth of our plant. So it works dual way. But it will take time. So it's not only nanoparticles. Our target is to form nano insecticides, nano pesticides, and nano fertilizers. And uh, I work with the University of Central Florida to synthesize these nanoparticles. And the target is this, we will make small nanotubes and we will enclose potassium, phosphorus, and this nano vesicle will release fertilizer for the duration of one month. Can you imagine? <laughs> you spray phosphorus, you spray potassium nitrogen, it's gone within two or three days. Once this vesicle is inside the plant, it will slowly release whatever you enclose up to a period of one month. And we did it, we enclosed glucose within these vesicles and glucose was released over a period of 23 days within the plant cell. 